reminder of a lot of concepts that we brought up in the morning, but um, put into a applied context. So um, if, you, uh, if some of you had a hard time following some segments this morning, uh, you'll get another chance this afternoon. So um, can we do it? No. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. We still are audaciously hopeful. <laughs> All right. So we were on to slide 106, I believe. And uh, we're going to take a look at nonlinear non growth, starting off with uh, one of the benefits of being in that SEM framework, namely being able to estimate time scores and uh, estimate deviations from uh, from linear growth. So let's take a look at that on slide 108. So uh, <clears throat> uh, the uh, starting point would be um, two latent variables, an intercept and a slope. But now you want to capture things like a development that uh, increases at a rapid rate, but then starts to slow down, a retardation of growth or an acceleration of growth. And we're going to see that this can be captured by estimating those time scores x for certain of the time points, letting them be truly parameters, factor loadings as they were in a factor analysis context. <clears throat>
So the mean of the slope growth factor is no longer a constant rate of change over all time points, but a uh, rate of change for time square change of 1. Uh, now, it's not hard to, to say what the change is for other time points. It's essentially uh, the uh, difference in time scores times the mean of the slope. But there are, there are some modifications to the, time, to the uh, growth slope factor. Um, let's take an example here. <coughs> in LSA, we're now going to expand the LSA analysis to include not only grades 7 through 10, but 11 and 12 as well. And in US schools, when it comes to mathematics, uh, we have the phenomenon on the left. For some reason, uh, these students don't seem to improve very much in math in grades 11 and 12. So uh, let's say that we uh, want to um, acknowledge that there is a accelerated growth in the grade 12. Well, here would be the model. IS bar math 7, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. But then asterisk 5, asterisk meaning a free parameter be estimated free parameter be estimated with starting value 5. You probably don't need that starting value, but that is, you know, you start at what the linear growth would have been, and then you let the program decide whether 5 <coughs> is a value or not. If, if it comes out to be 5, fine, then the growth is linear throughout all 12, all of these grades. And down here you have the alternative language. So let's see how that pans out here. We have a, a chi-square here, uh, and we're not going to be concerned with fit as much at this point. We have the time scores. We have the uh, unit uh, loadings for I. We ignore that. Focus on S instead, where the time scores pay in. Math 7, 0, 8, 1, 2, 3. And then on slide 114, <coughs> math 11 is 4. And here's the math 12 of interest turns out to be only 4.095, whereas the linear growth would have had it at 5. So it's an example of that retarded growth over there, deceleration. And um, you get an estimated standard error here, showing that this 4 is significantly different from 5. So the fact that that is less than 5 means that you have deceleration sort of a leveling out in the development of the mean of, of math achievement. If you want to test that that time score is different from 5, you take this number, minus 5, divided by the standard error, uh, and get a, a Z test, normal test, from that. What we give here in the third column is the default where you always test against 0. But testing 4 against 0 is not the relevant test in this case. So you have to, in some cases, you have to go in and do your own test to, to take four, di 4 minus 5 divided by 0.042 to get the right Z test. And um, that then will, uh, when, once you allow for that different time score, very similar to allowing for residual covariances, do you get different estimates for the uh, I and S? for the variances and covariances between those, those growth factors. <coughs> so that's easy, right? That was a swift thing to do. Uh, just modify that one from at to asterisk, and you allow for that nonlinear development. So that fits the model better, and therefore probably estimates key parameters better. There's a drawback, though, that um, you can't really uh, well describe how the development in the highest grades takes place or, or varies as a function of covariates. Because the effect, the nonlinearity, is captured by a time score. So that's not a variable. You know, it's not a variable uh, that you can use as a dependent, as a dv in, the, in some regression. You probably could if you did some trickery, but it's not an uh, easy way to do it. So let's take a look at other approaches. Uh, 
what if we try to fit a quadratic function here instead? So it starts off linear and then it uh, decreases. Uh, that, that expression then would say that feature, this, the look of this curve would suggest that you have a quadratic with, with a negative quadratic term. So a linear positive increase that diminishes would have a negative quadratic mean and in this case, a positive quadratic mean. So here's how you write the quadratic growth model. Then you have not only eta zero and eta one, but also eta two. And the time scores are then squared for the uh, quadratic term. Or, as is often useful, you uh, center time uh, by subtracting a centering constant. For instance, uh, average time is a useful centering point. So C is the centering constant, the average of time, and you stat the square of that for the quadratic. <coughs> in uh, when you have time as a observed variable in, in your data, the advantage of doing this centering is to make these two terms, the linear and the quadratic, a little bit less strongly related. They get to be highly correlated uh, if you don't do that. So it's a matter of collinearity, as it's called, uh, among uh, x variables that you want to avoid by centering like this. When the x's are instead parameters, not variables, that collinearity issue <coughs> comes up in terms of parameter estimates being highly correlated, which is something you can see in M plus tech 3 output. <coughs> so um, there is some advantage to centering um, uh, and not use the first time point uh, as a centering place for a quadratic growth. It doesn't hurt, but it could lead to, usually doesn't hurt, but could lead to problems. So anyway, um, these words have already been spoken. Uh, so the uh, time scores would be 0, 1, 2, 3, or 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and then the square of that for the, uh, for the A.2. <coughs> so you would have, um, Well, let me say, so the way you would specify this then in M plus using the by statements, the factor and analytic thing would be uh, uh, eta by y1 through whatever at one, and then eta one by the time scores, and eta two by the time scores squared. But uh, the growth model language, the bar statement would simply say I S Q bar and then you give the time scores for the uh, linear slope, 0, 1, 2, 3. So uh, I, S, Q, bar, Y1 at 0, Y2 at 1, Y3 at 2, and Y4 at 3. So it's quite simple to move to the quadratic. Now, um, yet another alternative is to work with time scores uh, that are um, different than uh, linear growth, uh, but are still not estimated. So nonlinear growth models with fixed time scores, two latent variables. So say that you have uh, substantive uh, theory for saying that you have a uh, logarithmic growth curve, and in some substantive areas there are such theories. So then you can let the time scores be fixed at the natural logar the logarithm. This is ln or the E log of time, and if you have time being 1, 2, 3, 4, the logarithm of that is 0, 0.69, 1.10, 1.39. 1 so they are fixed, but they're fixed to represent the nonlinear growth. So that's one version as well, less often used, because you often don't, at least in the social and behavioral sciences, you often don't have that kind of a theory ready. Likewise, you can have an exponential growth curve where you, the time scores are calculated by taking the uh, e to the power of t minus 1 minus 1. And you can work with these fixed time scores to represent this kind of exponential growth. But uh, I think what uh, really is a useful technique here is piecewise growth modeling. And um,
Slide 119 then um, shows an example where you have a, a development early on that has a flatter slope than later on. So there is a slope change part ways through. So the reverse could happen for uh, L say math, for instance, you could have steep linear growth at first and then less steep linear growth or no growth for uh, grades 11 and 12, for instance. So this is useful when you have different phases of development. You know um, where the phases uh, end and begin. So for instance, transition to high school after going into high school, the, the, the change may be different. Or before and after an intervention takes place is a good example. So the, the advantage here is that each piece has its own growth factor, in this case its own slope. So each piece is characterized by a variable, a slope variable. So the slope variable could be the dependent variable in uh, an equation where you use covariate to, pr to predict its variation. So you could have covariates that predict the slope for the first piece and other covariates or covariates with other coefficients that predict the slope for the second piece. And that's what we couldn't get with the uh, estimated time scores. And actually it's also hard to do that if you try to fit a quadratic here, three growth factors, uh, the, uh, it's hard to disentangle the predictors of the uh, early and the late development. Uh, it's true that the linear part of a quadratic seems to have more, has more of an effect early on and then the quadratic part takes over because the time scores get squared but it's not s clearly separated uh, in the quadratic model. So pred the predictions of the from the covariates um, are not as well easily interpreted. That's why statisticians come up with things like polynomial coefficients, which uh, you know, it's not the easiest to, to uh, interpret either, perhaps. But piecewise, then, is a, um, it's a good middle ground here. So what we have then is one intercept growth factor, but two slope growth factors. And you have slope one here and slope two on the last line. So the way you read that is um, you think of how the mean, mean changes on y across time. So, change, so thanks to the time score changing from zero to one, the slope mean has no effect here, right? Uh, it's only an intercept that has an effect on the mean of y here. At this time point, the mean of y is affected by the intercept plus the slope and plus two times the slope. So you see an increase from here to here. That is, uh, that's from here to the third time point. But then this process, the first slope, has no more effect. So you have two, 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 two. So it stalls here, it levels out. So there's no increase in the mean of y from time point three to time point four and onwards thanks to the first process, the first slope. But instead the second slope kicks in. When this stalls here, you have an increase from zero to one in the, for the second slope. So the second slope describes the um, increase in the second piece. Does that make sense? So if you think of how the means increase, you know, it's increased by one uh, slope, S1 slope mean here, here and here, but here the S1 slope mean does not help in increasing the Y mean, but instead the S2 uh, mean kicks in with one unit here, two and three units there. So, uh, you know, you don't have to memorize how these time scores should behave. Can you hear me in the back? It sounds like my uh, battery is fading, but maybe not. So instead you can recreated by just thinking about how you want the means to change. So an example of that then is, um, well here's another version of that where not only the slopes but the intercepts <coughs> are different. So the intercept here is different than the intercept here. You get a jump, which is often useful as well. Could be a reason for this jump here. And uh, it's really then two uh, separate processes that you're modeling both the intercept and the growth factors are separate. Uh, 
sequential model is one way of, of interpreting that. So you can actually have uh, uh, one growth model, I1, S1, bar, Y1, and then Y1, Y2, Y3, and another I2, S2, bar, Y4, Y5, Y6, you split it up as two separate processes. They are correlated, but um, still uh, dealt with separately. But I'm going to focus on the first um, um, approach in 119. And here's how you apply that to ELSE. So again, we add math 11 and math 12. And uh, we have then two slope factors, exactly the ones we're talking about on the previous slide, slide 119. So the uh, time scores for the first slope factor is, well, zero, first of all, for math seven, but then one for math eight, two for math nine, three for math 10, three for math 11, and three for math 12. So the process stalls out after um, math 10. And then S2 captures the increase. S2 has zero for math seven, math eight, math nine, and math 10. Since those paths are not, paths are not drawn, they're zero. So then the increase due to the uh, second slope is between 10 and 11. So you start over with another group process, 10 through 12 here, or another slope. Uh, so it's linear from 10 to 12 here for S2 and linear from 7 to 10 for S1. So that will, if you have a um, leveling off that starts already in math in grade 11, this will be very useful. And the advantage once again is that now you have growth factors representing this nonlinearity. So you can uh, let those growth factors have their own predictors. Uh, because substantively it may be very interesting to study uh, early and late growth rate. Uh, for instance, if you introduce a, uh, an educational program in schools uh, that increases the reading development rate, uh, you want to know then if the rate increase is due to the intervention. So a zero one dummy variable that influences S2. And both S1 and S2 are influenced by a lot of covariates, background variables, but S1 is not influenced by the intervention because S1 refers to the development before the intervention. So you get things very nicely structured and uh, easily understandable and interpretable. And then um, the way to do that is now old hat and simple. You have I and S1, and in this case, we have fixed time scores, but look, look at them, 0, 1, 2, 3, 3, 3, just like we talked about. And then you have the same intercept again. You can define the same intercept. All that says is that I is measured by math 7 through 12 at 1. There's no, um, no difficulty there. And then the time score is 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. So an increase from math grade 10 to 11, 1 and 2. And then you have I and S1 and S2 onto the uh, time invariant covariates. And the alternative language is given here at the bottom. And here's the um, estimated model. So the question is then, uh, is there any substantive, substantively interesting difference in predicting S1 and S2? So we are going to look here, over there where the red dot is, and compare for S1, compare that to S2. And it looks like uh, the significant mother's education and home resources influence disappear in the higher grades. They are insignificant, less than 1.96 down here. Uh, so uh, that home background doesn't help you in the higher grades, only in the earlier grades is what this would suggest. So that could be uh, of substantive interest. So the, the advantages is that you have two dependent variables to work with. And uh, 
clearly defined. The disadvantage is that you have to decide on a uh, transition point, transition point here, uh, which should be the same for everyone in the sample and has to make substantive sense. Uh, entering middle school, entering high school. Uh, in this case, I don't know if it's substantively meaningful to separate growth from 7 to 10 and 10 to 12, but um, it might be. Certainly for randomized interventions, it's uh, useful. Now, if you have, um, th this, this uh, transition point can also be individually varying. It can't be in this framework, but it can be in other more general frameworks. The transition point can be individually varying and can be estimated. That's quite advanced uh, modeling. People have used that to see when the effect of an intervention actually starts taking place. Uh, and people then tend to use um, a Bayesian modeling analysis perspective instead of a maximum likelihood frequentist perspective. But if you're interested in that, you can send me an email and I can give you references on that. You have now graduated to intermediate growth models. Wow. And it's only 2.30. We're in good shape. And <clears throat> as the first intermediate growth model, we're going to take one straight out of uh, the Raudenbusch and Breit book. So now for those of you who are fami more familiar with the multilevel perspective, you will be happy to see this slide. And we're going to make, as we try throughout here, we're going to make connections between multi-level modeling and latent variable modeling approaches to growth. So if you look at, um, and we're going to talk about two topics here at the same time. If you keep that in mind, it'll be easier. A uh, more pedagogical approach would be to talk about one at a time, but then it takes too long. But just to keep in mind, we're talking about two separate topics at the same time. First topic is individually varying times of observation. And the second topic is random slopes with time varying covariates. Now, your task is, should you uh, agree to it, to translate individually varying times of observation and random slopes with time varying covariates into equation 55. What on equation 55 tells you that that's what we're talking about? Time's up. All right, so let's, before we say that, time point is still T, individual is still I, Y, T, I, repeated measure of the outcome. A1 is time-related variable. A2 is a time-varying covariate, like math course taking, which we're going to talk about. X is a time-invariant covariate, grade 7 expectations, or like we talked about before, um, the um, mother's ex uh, education and home resources. So here, uh, we're going to formulate this in multi-level terms. So it'll be a two-level analysis. Level one, variation across time. Again, if you want to read up on this, Raudenbusch and Bragg's chapter or something talks about it. Level two, variation in the coefficients, random effects. Here we have three random effects. This is pi, not 3.14, but a... Um, latent variable pi, random effect, random intercept, random slope, multiplying the time-related variable A1, like grade, and pi 2, which is a random slope for a time-varying covariate A2. Uh, note then that we have added I, the subscript I for A1, so it's not only T but I, so that is the answer to the question, individually varying times of observations. And random slopes for time varying covariates is that we have I, not only T, but I for pi 2. So that I and that I, that's the essence of the story here. And this model, had, for two reasons, this model cannot be estimated in the SEM framework of a mean and covariance structure model. SEM frameworks, the standard ones, are not good at capturing, cannot capture products of random variables. 
pi 1 is a random variable, a 1 is a random variable. They're random because they both have subscript i. Same for pi 2 and a 2. Products of random variables make you fall out of that mean and covariance structure framework of SEM. But in the general latent variable framework, of which multi-level modeling is a part, that's not a problem. Again, we have the random intercept uh, level 2 equation, random slope equation, but we can also let the uh, pi 2 coefficient vary as a function of a uh, covariate. So if you want to think about this in terms of math, A2 would then be math course taking, and pi 2 varying across individuals implies that for the same amount of course taking, uh, different individuals benefit differently have different multiplier p, pi 2 of that course taking and benefit differently. Uh, so different benefit for different individuals. Now the ELSA data set is not a good example of exemplifying the I for A1, the individual times of observations, because there are none. But we're going to insist on doing that anyway, just to show you how M plus would be set up for that. So the way I would draw, here's the connection then between what you find in the Ryder, Bush, and Bryce multi-level book and how I would draw it in a model diagram form that then can be directly translated into M plus, an M plus script, an input for the program. So you have the outcomes up here. You have the growth factors I and S. <coughs> you have the time invariant covariates back here, uh, which influence the growth factors. Then you have course taking here, course taking in grades 7, 8, 9, and 10. Sometimes I put MTH before that, so a different notation here, but that's course taking, time varying covariate. Time varying covariates influence the math outcomes directly. You know, you see that over here in equation 55. A, these guys here, course taking is the A2 variable. It influences Y1, right? A2 does not sit down here, but it sits up there. So the direct influence is what you draw here. And then the slope for the, the influence of course taking, or the regression rather of math on course taking, has a slope, which is a slope for a time varying covariate, STVC. And that slope <coughs> is, uh, can vary across time. 1, 2, t equals 1, t equals 2, t equals 3, t equals 4. So a to t here varies across time and can vary across people as well. So it has an i, the different effect of a certain amount of course taking. Usually I would think in the multi-level context, you let pi vary across i, but not across t. Certainly if you have, take a, a, uh, the long version of the data, the uh, univariate two-level approach, you cannot make a distinction between the time points. So uh, there would be no dependence on, on t here for, for pi 2, but only across i. But certainly you can do uh, multivariate HLM as well, in which case you would have access to t variation of pi 2 as well as i variation. But I would think that the i variation is more common. Anyway, this, this then is uh, the M plus uh, picture for, for doing the modeling of these formulas here. Here's what the M plus input would look like. And uh, just as an addition here, we are going to do the grand mean centering of all of the covariates, <coughs> subtracting the sample mean from each one of them except for female, because we don't want to have the mean there. We just accept that zero is the uh, uh, male case. Now, what about the, uh, so the we have two things to, to, uh, to modify here, individually varying time scores and also um, random effects for the time varying covariates. So the first complication, how do you handle that? Well, these A, A variables that we talked about, course taking, sorry, this is, these are the grades then. Let me go back to slots here. We're talking about A1. Let's now 
read in A1, instead, since it varies across I, or at least we want to be able to allow for that, we read it in as a variable. It's no longer a parameter because it has an I subscript. So we call that a time score variable, T scores. So each person has in the data set that you see up here a time variable for each of the grades. So potentially the, a, the grade 7 value could be the first occasion could have a different time value. For, for this data set it doesn't. It's 0 for everyone and A8 is 1 for everyone, etc. But you could do it and then in the model, slide 130, you would use the at option. So math 7 to math 10 are measured at measured at time points A7 through A10. So it's a variable, and you regress on to that variable, y on x, x being time, or y on A rather here. So that, so the uh, t-scores and the at, t-scores and at takes care of individually varying times of observation, which is not needed for LSA, but let me just show you as a principle. Second complication uh, was STVC here, slope for the time varying covariates. We want that to be varying across individuals. That's what we couldn't handle in the uh, SEM framework. We use a bar statement there as well, slope for time varying covariate, bar meaning that the regression coefficient for math 7 on course taking in grade 7, this one, is that slope is not fixed, it's not the same for everyone, but it's a random slope. So the slope for math 7 re regressed on course taking in grade 7 is a random slope. A random slope meaning it's a variable, right? It has a mean and a variance. The fact that the variance is greater than zero implies that it's a random slope. And we're saying that we have a random slope for each of the four time points. Note that we have here, in this case, the same name. So it's the same random slope, implying that we hold it equal across time. We don't let that random slope vary across time, only across people. But we could have said STVC7, STVC8, etc. That would be fine as well. So here is the introduction of random slopes, how M plus does that more generally. It's with a vertical bar again, just like in the growth model language, because they are analogous. And uh, what you have to do in the analysis state uh, command, you have to say that you have random. Whenever you introduce these bar statements for regressions, you have to say random up there. Uh, if you forget it, the program will tell you. But then you have the option of regressing not only INS, but also STVC onto um, the uh, background variables here, like we're showing. So thereby, you can handle the uh, multi-level equations that we described. And, um, here then on slide 131, you get um, a log likelihood value, but we don't anymore get chi-square test for model fit. So here now we're on our own, and I'm going to get back to that for a while, after a while, but um, let's leave that at that for now. Here are the estimates. You have I, S, and STVC regressed onto the three background variables. So uh, it's an interesting uh, model here. <coughs> Note that um, STVC is also significant for home resources down here, uh, implying that home resources, how, how do you interpret that for those of you who have never done that? So this, this is sort of like multi-level modeling in the cross-sectional setting. Uh, it's akin to the same reasoning. So as home resources increase, the slope for the time varying covariates increases, implying that the homes with higher home resources, uh, the course taking has more of an effect on Y. So 
higher the home resources, the higher the STVC, and the fact that that coefficient is higher implies that a certain value would impact math more. So it's an intricate way of saying that you have an interaction between home resources and course taking. When both are high, you get most of, more of the effect. So it's uh, interaction effects uh, uh, are, are related to random slopes, is what we can conclude, right? When, but the causal chain is home resources increases the slope. The slope tells you for a given course taking how much effect it will have on math. And the higher STVC is, the higher the effect. So um, home resources makes you able to benefit from a certain amount of course taking more. Uh, you take more advanced courses and get more help in the home, perhaps. So that's an interesting uh, approach then, and uh, it is the, uh, the more standard uh, multi-level approach that we see uh, used often in programs like HLM. So the question, your question is very pith here, I think, that uh, why don't you get any chi-square with random slopes or random variables? So we have here, there are two, two random slopes, one for time and one for the time varying covariate. And um, this slide tries to say why you never see a chi-square test of overall model fit in programs like a proc, uh, uh, proc mixed or uh, HLM uh, or MLWIN either, I think. <coughs> because consider as an example an, an individually varying times of observations A1TI. So you have the time uh, variable has a variation across I. So you have this expression. I've dropped the, the time varying covariate. I've dropped that out of the picture. And I'm going to then what, what is the variance of y at a certain time point and time value? It's the variance of the intercept, variance of the slope times the time square squared, plus a covariance between the two. And we see then, therefore, that the variance of y changes as a function of the uh, time score values here. The fact that a1 is part of the variance expression means that the variance of y changes uh, across these time scores. So there is not a constant sigma, sigma being the population covariance matrix for these outcomes, to test the model fit for. In the SEM world, we talk about a single sigma, sig single population covariance matrix that we uh, want to do the test for, and here we don't have that. Sigma changes. So uh, as far as I understand, nobody so far has tackled the uh, idea or the problem of overall test the model fit when you have random slopes. So that's why you have no chi-square, no chi-square test in the SEM sense. And what you have to rely on instead is working with these neighboring models, ne one model nested within a less, within a less restrictive model. And instead of chi-square, look at the likelihood and work with two times the log likelihood difference that we showed in the previous slides. That is something you can always fall back on. So uh, in, in, in the statistical world, uh, very, most often I would say you don't work with these overall test of model fit. You work with m comparing neighboring models and then looking at residual diagnostics. And this is certainly a case in point. I have to burden you with a little bit of technical stuff here because it will influence <coughs> your analyses you bear with me. Um, the uh, theory comes at the top and then the practice, the implications at the bottom. So <clears throat> we're working with maximum likelihood and uh, we are considering the distribution of y and x. y being these guys and x being everything down here now in this sense. All the covariates is put together into x. And by regular statistics, that can be written as the conditional distribution of y given x times the marginal distribution of x. P of a and b is the same as probability of a given b times probability of b. So x is the marginal distribution of x. Uh, it's this bracket around x is the marginal distribution for x. 
And again, like in linear regression modeling, we don't put any structure on this, typically. Totally freely correlated variables. Now, normal theory maximum likelihood says that uh, doing maximum likelihood for the joint distribution of y and x gives the same results as doing it for the conditional distribution when there's no missing data. It's a reference, classic reference on that. And that's typically the case that's used in structural equation. This is the approach that's used in structural equation modeling. Uh, you consider the likelihood for y and x jointly. And when missing data on x, uh, this normality assumption that you start off with for x is not innocuous. So it is ocuous. So it is, uh, you know, something um, that carries weight. You're making an assumption. Uh, it's an additional assumption than the assumptions needed for the model. So when you're missing on x, the usual SEM approach actually makes an additional assumption on normality for x's, which is not part of the original model, but is the assumption that you typically would use, and now I'm slipping into missing data modeling, that you typically would use if you do so-called multiple imputations for missing data, which we're going to talk about tomorrow after lunch. Now, why given x? It makes normality assumptions for residuals. Why given x, not for x? No assumptions on the x. Typically used in every other statistical approach outside of SEM. And in M plus, it's used with type equals random, type equals mixture, and with the non-normal outcomes of the categorical sensor and count kind. It would delete individuals with missing data on any x. You can bring them back in by including x in the model, assuming normality, and there are tricks to do that. But why I'm telling you all of this uh, is ma mainly here now, is that these two approaches give different sample sizes and the likelihood and big values, big being the Bayesian information criterion that we're going to use later on, are not on a comparable scale. And people often make the mistake here of comparing um, likelihoods across these two different approaches. So uh, the likelihood metric in the y given x scale is uh, not a function of the x's, whereas uh, y and x, the joint distributional uh, approach, is a function of both y and x's. So we'll see that played out in, in a couple of variations on this time invariant, uh, time variant covariates theme. Now, are you ready for this? This is what your uh, assignment, I mean exercise number one, was all about. So here's the answer. And then those of you who still haven't done it, you can uh, plug your ears. So we have looked at two models so far. And this is all uh, new material for those who were here in August last year. Model M1 is the SEM type of model. Here are the time varying covariates. And the uh, slopes here are not varying across people, but are typically varying across the different time points, across the grades. On the right, M2, that's the model we just talked about, more typical in multi-level modeling world. Slope for the time varying covariates are uh, varying across individuals, but typically held equal across time points, although that's not essential. By the way, the broken arrows uh, are used to separate that from uh, regressions. This is not a regression here. It's more of an, it's an assignment of that slope to that path. That's why we have broken arrows there. So model M one and model M2, the question is which fits best? So what's your answer? Well, let's take a look at M1. The reason I mentioned that likelihood metric difference is that the way we did M1 before was like in the SEM world, where we looked at y, x jointly. <coughs> But model M2 doesn't come from the SEM world, and it uses the y given x log likelihood metric. So therefore, we have to uh, reanalyze model M1 in the y given x metric to make it comparable to M2. 
And an easy way of doing that is to just say type equals random here for model M1, given the log likelihood in the yx metric as the common says. <coughs> and then we simply say math on math courses for each of the grades. These are fixed effects, not random slopes, fixed slopes. Same for everyone in the sample. That's what model M1 was about, right? That's the um, time varying covariance in an SEM world. world. And here's the um, chi-square. We get a chi-square test of model fit because here we don't have the complication of random slopes for random variables. On slide 139. Uh, CFI and TLI are, leave something to be desired here. And so does chi-square, but let's put that aside for now. Let's go to slide 142. And then at the bottom here is where it starts getting uh, interesting math. Seven or math courses, seven. Uh, positive slope, it, it pays to take math courses. And it, there's a significant positive influence is what it says there. And uh, it's different, a little bit different for grade seven and grade eight and grade nine and grade 10. But if you go back again, it all hovers above 0.9 and 1.0. So not too different influence of math course taking at the different grades, right? Not too different. Doesn't tell you anything about variation across people, but only across time. Now, um, we also have modification indices here. On slide 145, and where are the big ones? Well, here's a bolded one to help us. I on math course is seven. We're still in model M1. Why do we have such a whopping modification index for I on math course seven? And what does that even mean? Well, here's where I think it gets interesting being in the latent variable world as opposed to in the multi-level world. In the multi-level world, we said that the time varying covariates, A2, influence Y directly, but A2 does not appear here, does not appear on level two. A2 is not a predictor of the intercept as is suggested over here. You wouldn't get that association of uh, trying to let the math course taking time varying covariate influence a growth factor. You wouldn't get that association, that idea from this multi-level framework. That's why I like the more flexible latent variable framework. Uh, so what does that suggest? Well, it suggests that math course taking in the first, in grade seven, actually helps the starting point for a student. Why isn't that of interest? That seems to be logical, right? Why not? And maybe math course taking also influences S. So uh, S has high modification indices on both slide 146 and 147. S on math course taking has modification indices that are important. So really, I think we have a model M3 here, an idea for a model M3. Uh, but let's hold off one second and just first, first of all, let's correct the typo here. We should say V instead of I here time varying covariates, not time invariant covariates. So tick is a time invariant covariate, but it should say TVC for time varying covariate here. So change the I to a V in both these places here. And slide 149. But anyway, um, so the first model, um, now we have the models in a log likelihood metric that's comparable. If we didn't do that, it would say something totally different for M1. If we hadn't done that type equals random trick, Log likelihood, number of parameters, and BIC is a Bayesian information criterion, which is at a low point, that is the best point.
point if the log likelihood is high for relatively few parameters. So um, you see here then that the log likelihood, uh, now you have to read log likelihoods, mine and on B on the minus scale. So minus 26,846 uh, is a uh, lower likelihood, right? It's, sorry, it's a higher likelihood. Uh, this value, this value is further down negative than this value. So M1 is down here, M2 is here, and M3 is here. But M3 uh, adds more parameters than M1 and M2, so BIC penalizes that additional parameters. So you really should take the BIC that's the lowest. But nevertheless, BIC uh, says that Model 3 wins. Model 3 wins. It has the lowest BIC value of all the three. You just can, I, I haven't told you what Model 3 is yet, although I alluded to it. But if you look at Model 1 and Model 2, so Model 1 is the SEM model, Model 2 is the multi-level model. Which one would you choose of these two? Well, BIC is better for M2, so maybe you should choose M2, the multi-level model. Uh, you add three more parameters. Three more parameters, and you have here a, a gain in likelihood of 24 points. We know we should multiply by 2. That's 48. Uh, if you think chi-square, 48 is a very high significant number relative to 3 degrees of freedom, 3 parameter difference. So you can say chi-square with 3 degrees of freedom equals 48 when you compare M1 and M2. And <clears throat> that's saying that M1 fits significantly worse than M2. M1 fits significantly worse than M2 if you were to use the chi-square test, which is based on the two times log likelihood difference. The only problem with that is that the chi-square difference test is not valid. One of the uh, slides back there, there was a last bullet that I skipped saying that you can't compare models, uh, can't use chi-square for models that are nested so that this model is a special case of that where the variance of the random slope is zero. When you have parameters uh, on the border of their admissible space, and this is technical, but it comes up again and again, this variance, when it's zero, it turns into a fixed effect, right? Much like we have here. But then the variance is zero, which is on the border of the admissible space. And then it's not OK to think of that log likelihood difference between M1 and M2 as a chi-square variant. So chi-square is forbidden for that. It doesn't work well, and you can't get it published. But you can, re that's always a good threat to have. <laughs> but then you can always rely on BIC. That is publishable, and saying that this BIC is lower, so pick M2. M2. But if it were, if you could have used chi-square, it would have said the same thing. But M3 uh, beats each of the two previous one handily by a much lower BIC. So what is M3? Well, let's see. Slide 150, which is the answer to your um, first exercise. Yes, you could have done that. Uh, time variant covariance model M3. So why not listen to the modification analysis opening up your world and say that um, course taking in grade 7 could influence I. We've added this path to the previous two models. Uh, why, don't, why don't I say that course taking grade 8 and 9, 10 influence I? Because that hasn't happened yet when I is defined. I is defined as being a grade 7 quantity, the systematic part of the variation in math at grade 7. So only grade 7 course taking is relevant as a predictor, not the later ones. They haven't occurred yet. I is centered at 7 because we see S does not point to math 7. Now hopefully it all comes together now. Uh, S does not point to math 7, so I is centered at grade 7, which implies that it's the uh, variation at that time point. So we can have course taking grade 7 influencing I 
although that could be a little bit doubtful time-wise because I think uh, course taking uh, was, uh, well, testing was done in the fall. Testing was done in the fall, and not all of the course taking has taken place then already. But uh, you can speculate that course taking in grade seven has to do performance previously, so uh, it is sort of a precursor nevertheless. Now, what about S? S is a slope, so it governs the development over all grades, so therefore we use all of the course taking variables as predictors of S. Why not? The more courses you take, the faster you grow. Why shouldn't that be allowed? Well, I don't know. I don't know, I think it should be. So that's model M3, and that gives you that much better model fit. But you don't see a hint of that over here, because A2 is limited to level one, does not appear on level two. So again, that's a reason I find it more flexible to be in this framework, the framework of uh, slide 150, the latent variable framework. I haven't seen, I don't know about you, but I haven't seen this model uh, used in the literature. I haven't seen this model, so um, take it and run, run with it. Uh, maybe you can get it by the editors. They are progressive. So it's just an example of showing you the more flexible thinking you could have here. Uh, certainly many other variations are possible as well, like home resources, mother's education, uh, having direct influence for certain early time points. Not all of it's effect being indirect, I don't know. Here's the input for model M3. Uh, type equals random, and uh, STVC, STVC is like before. Just, this is just like for model M2. But what we have added to model M3 over model M2 is the last two lines. Those two lines here makes all the difference. And we'll reduce all of those big modification indices that you saw. I didn't go back to look at the modification indices after I did that, but you would want to do that if, if you like this model. And um, here's the effect. I on math course taking seven, strongly significant, and um, I don't quite know how to um, understand this size. I would have to look at it in a standardized scale, which I don't have here. And then S on not only the time invariant covariates, but some of the time varying covariates as well. So um, then you can ask yourself, well, how do the other effects change like STVC? And um, it seems like STVC significance, he said the home resources were a significant predictor of sl the slope for the time varying covariates. That's no longer so when you include these new features of M3. So it makes a substantive, substantial difference which model you choose. Say that again? We'll get to that. Good question. OK, let's talk about another kind of time varying covariate. <coughs> Uh, here is, on the left, why I call this a nonlinear modeling technique is that you imagine, if you ignore the time varying covariates, you imagine that you have a development over time here based on I and S, which is in the presence of time varying covariates having value zero. So you can, for instance, center them, grand mean center them to the, uh, to the uh, average course taking, and then the development would be for a, a student who takes average course taking. A person who takes more advanced courses in grade eight than the average would probably have a little jump in grade eight. So it would be a line that has a jump. And likewise for grade nine and 10. So you'd have these little jumps to the uh, linear development jumps due to the time varying covariates. That's why I'm saying it's a nonlinear technique. <coughs> I think econometricians call that random shocks. It's a shock here to the system. 
bouncing it up in this case or pulling it down in other cases. On the right, you have another variation on that theme, uh, time variant covariance representing status change. So you have this development, which is linear, but for some people, you have a status change at time one, which or at over here, which makes the development be much lower, follow a lower line throughout. It's not a temporary jump, but it's a development throughout. And another jump at time two and jump three, perhaps. So it just uh, goes in, in a direction, in cer one certain direction, and stays uh, lower or higher throughout. Now this is then uh, some, an idea that we used in an earlier paper that's out in the alcohol literature. Uh, Curran, Mutian, and Hartford. Uh, we worked with uh, NLSY data, I believe it was. So you have alcohol use as dependent variable, and you have the intercept and slope over here, <coughs> and a whole group of uh, time invariant covariates. But then you have a time variant covariate here, which is a status change. In this case, it had to do with marital status. So people who, who get married tend to uh, lower their alcohol use on average. And then, therefore, so here's their trajectory, and if, if they had uh, not gotten married, they would have continued on the high trajectory. But then here they get married, calm down, get a little on a lower tra trajectory. Those who get married a little bit later, uh, maybe it's the effect is not as big. So the way you do this here, uh, which we did in the paper, I managed to get public, is um, you have a switch here. Nobody's married when this starts. Some get married time one. Some get married at the other time points. Nobody gets divorced either. It's a simple world here for us. <laughs> uh, and then uh, you have a, a, a time varying factor which uh, changes the development uh, at that point and thereafter. So time two, for instance, uh, does not influence time one, but it just pulls it down for time two, three, and four. Likewise, time four only pulls it down for time four. And these are then latent variables, which are predicted by the observed status variables. And uh, note then that uh, there is no residual here. And it's just a mean change, in other words. The mean of this little uh, sort of a, like a dummy latent variable gets pulled, uh, gets pulled down when, the, when you get married. So when you get married, you get a minus sign for this, which is a negative mean corresponding to the picture on the right, pulling it down. So that would be a, a status change that's sort of permanent. Uh, perhaps, perhaps that should be used for, for uh, the math development. Once you start taking these courses, it's a lasting effect. Uh, true, you could have done that, you could have um, tried that also in this case. Uh, you could have had effects here from course taking seven that persist throughout. So course taking seven influences not only seven, but eight, nine, and ten. Uh, and you can even estimate if it has a diminishing effect across time. But um, this model, 156 is, a, is more of a model of status change. You just move into a different group of people uh, across time. So you can find that reference in, at the back. So let's see, how are we doing on time? 10 past 3, we want to have a break at 3.30. And we are on page 156, so we're heading towards a good conclusion here. 200 pages total. Uh, so um, let's see, what do we have after here? Uh, just, let's just talk about this so we have it done and, and have it out of the way for uh, <coughs> after the break. So uh, these computational issues were more of an of a issue uh, in the early days of M plus, now there's been a lot of improvement in terms of uh, starting values and uh, algorithms to make it smoother. 
Uh, but it could still be true for some models that um, certainly when variances decrease over time, it makes the modeling more difficult and you have to be more creative. <coughs> That's about as much as I can say about that. Good luck. Scale of the observed variables. By scale, I, I mean uh, variance. If the variances of the observed variables, you know, uh, if you have covariates and if you have uh, outcome variables, covariates that are, have a variance of around one and uh, outcome y variables that have a variance of about a thousand, uh, it could make the uh, algorithms inefficient. And what you could do simply is divide your y variable by 10 to get the variance down. That's not harmful and just makes things work more smoothly. Non-convergence often happens or can happen, particularly with random slopes. Uh, program couldn't stop because the maximum number of iterations has been reached. <coughs> uh, you could then, if you have no negative residual variances, uh, no variances that are negative, then you can increase the number of iterations. Uh, but it, it, there is a problem if you have large negative variances. <coughs> it could be that um, you need better starting values, but very more often nowadays, if you get negative residuals, I'm sorry, negative variance estimates, if they're large, uh, your model is probably m most likely misspecified. So you want to modify it in various ways. Typical example is when you have very, very non-normal outcomes for ceiling effects, or if you have neglected to include uh, correlated residuals across times, uh, or other neglects uh, will cause negative variances. And you want to modify your model before you go on. Um, let's see. Uh, bottom bullet is still fairly relevant. Non-convergence may be caused by zero random slope variance, which indicates that the slope should be fixed rather than random. Now that's uh, an important point, even now. So what you, when you work with these random slopes, and I'm not, I'm not talking about uh, random slopes for, um, uh, for the uh, growth rate, uh, at least not when you have, um, when you, when you don't have individually varying times of observations, the random slope, the growth rate is not an issue. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about random slopes for time varying covariates or random slopes for, for time scores that are individually varying, what I call true random slopes, uh, like we have in um, multi-level um, cross-sectional modeling. <coughs> it could be, for instance, if you have a, a a, uh, an effect of the time varying covariance that does not vary across the individuals, where the variance is close to zero or zero for the uh, effect of time varying covariance. There is no real subscript i there that's relevant. Then it can take a while or may actually not converge because uh, the variance gets smaller and smaller in the iterations on its way to zero. So if you have non-convergence and you have random slopes in the, the output, in the non-converged, unfinished output, you will very often see a low or zero variance uh, preliminary value for the estimate of the variance that's z close to zero. Then you know you didn't need that, that slope to be random. And you just specify it as fixed instead. So Y, uh, Y7, math seven on uh, course taken in seven uh, without the bar st statement, fixed slope instead of a random slope. So that, that can happen. That certainly is still relevant. All right, folks, um, we're right on time. We have 15 minutes for questions and answers. And then we move on to uh, even more exciting things. So let's see who has a question. Yes. Uh, 156. <coughs> this is about time during covariance. So obviously the assumption is if you have a time during covariance, that they're measured at the same time as your outcome. Not measured as your outcome. So if you had a situation. 
situation where developmentally you expected a time during the period and then one happens for a subsequent time you know, in a later outcome, do you have to have this, um, do you have to construct this latent factor in order to do that? Yeah, so let's see. What is the slide where we have the, um, I can actually do that over here. Where we have the more standard picture. So here, for instance. So your question is, what if these are not lined up in, at the same time as the uh, outcomes? Right, what if you think it's something should go to nine? Yeah. You, you, you can, I, I wouldn't say that you're forced to do it exactly like this. Okay. You can certainly say that uh, this course taking 70 influences all of the time points with free slopes to be estimated. Free but fixed slopes. Free but non-random slopes, I should say. Not to sound like an oxymoron but for, for the different time points. But you can also, if you measure this uh, after grade 7, say in the summertime, it would not influence math 7 but would influence math 8. So I think uh, the timing and the effects, uh, you have a lot of flexibility there. Okay. This is not as rigid as it looks. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> yeah. Um, this is a question about the slide. Sort of, uh, 118. Uh, 120. No, it's, uh, you should think that they're, they're equal instead. So there's no increase due to uh, S1. Oh, I'm, because Y is getting closer. Yeah, right. So this is the uh, increase that you're looking for. Right. And then just a quick question. Is, is there any benefit to doing um, a two-piece model if you only have two points on either side? Um, I don't think so. You, for, for the, for the piece-wise, you really want to have a full growth model for each piece. So full growth model, minimum of three, optimally four. But you can certainly get away with uh, shorter time spans. For instance, uh, I've been doing a lot of work lately on uh, uh, placebo response in antidepressant trials, clinical trials, where they have typically uh, two pre-randomization time points, baseline and uh, at the end of washout. So you have, I do it then a piecewise before randomization and then after randomization. The first piece has only two time points. That's doable. Uh, I do that then the first piece as a random intercept fixed slope, which works. And then I take, take this approach, separation in, uh, in, because you often have a big jump when the trial gets going. So not only the slope but the intercept are allowed to be different. So the first piece, is linear and actually the second piece is like this but quadratic. Yeah. Thanks. Yes, in the back. Um, I'm a little bit confused about um, the uh, syntax for the growth models. So how would, for this example, how would the, these two growth model syntax differ? Um, so you have one variable measured at four different time points, week zero, week one, week four, and week 16. And you wanted to look at the linear trend forward and then you wanted to look at quadratic. How would those two differ? How would the syntax differ? Okay, so syntax differences between a linear model and a quadratic? Right, but the time points of the, 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 the variables aren't measured linearly. There's not equal. There's, the, the time points are not equidistant? Right, yeah. So, uh, uh, so if you have, um, for instance, the measurement here, first time point, second, and third, and then you jump to five and six here. So you would have the time scores zero, one, two here, and then not three, but four over here. Uh, for a linear model, but for the quadratic, so that would be the time scores for S. So uh, the time scores then for, for Q, the quadratic, would be the square of that. 
But the synt syntax is very easy. Uh, so uh, you have I S bar, and then the same. And on the y, on the right hand side of the bar, you have y one at zero, y two at one, y three at three. In that case, uh, and for the quadratic, you would have almost everything the same except you say I S Q bar, but then the same time score because the time scores that you give on the right hand side of the bar are the, the ones for the linear slope. So it's exactly the same on the right hand side of the bar. So when you go from linear, to answer your question, when you go from linear to quadratic, all you add is a Q after the I and S on the left hand side of the vertical bar. And for some reason, I don't have an example of that input in the slides here so far. I should probably add that. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 149. 149. Say that again. Yeah, so once again, here's an example of an SCM oriented time varying covariance model. It can be modified by letting you have lagged effects like this. But the essence is that these slopes are fixed in the sense they don't vary across people, <coughs> they can vary across time points. On the right is the more common multi level approach. Coefficients are random, that is, they vary across people, uh, may or may not vary across time. On the left, then M1 is, is the traditional one. Uh, sorry, on the right, the M1 is traditional, and the M2 is this model here, where STVCs do not vary across time, but across people. Um, and then M3 three is this, this hybrid, which you may or may. My question was how do you make a calculation in order to accept, uh, say, that M2 is better or worse on the base of the log likelihoods? Uh, for the comparison between M1 and M2, that's good to repeat that. Comparison to be between M1 and M2 cannot be done via a like likelihood ratio chi square difference test because uh, it involves fixing this, the variance to zero here to go from M2 to M1. Instead, you would have to work with BIC. So the fact that the, this BIC is lower than that BIC makes you choose M2. Now, M2 and M3, however, uh, can be compared not only with respect to BIC, where M3 wins, but uh, they can also be compared with respect to the chi-square. Because M2 is a special case of M3. M2 is a special case of M3 not by fixing a variance to zero, but M2 fixes the influences from these cores taken to INS to zero. And they are regular regression coefficients which can be zero and not on the border of the admissible space. So you could play the uh, uh, likelihood difference game here. So, eight, so what, what is that? That's like um, 400 points times two, 800 points with four degrees of freedom. Chi squared with four degrees of freedom equals to 800, which is a very uh, extremely strong uh, rejection of M2 in favor of M3. So I'm glad you brought that up. So M2 and M3 can be compared by the likelihood ratio chi-square. M1 and M2 cannot be. All of them can be compared with respect to big. Yeah. Uh, it's like 150 feet. 150? See how, how coarse the influence is with slope. Um, what, what, I, what I'm not quite sure I can get my head around is um, whether it matters or not that the slope is estimated uh, by using uh, math 8, 9, and 10, which are already influenced by coarse. And then slope is also influenced by coarse. Mm -hmm. If you see what I mean. And I wonder yeah. how this doesn't lead to quite collinearity problems. Yeah, so it's interesting. These coarse taking variables influence math both indirectly and directly. So it's an indirect and direct effect situation. 
And um, it's uh, usually, for those, for those of you who were here in March, this model looks very much like a mimic model. Make that association, or you may not have thought about it. A mimic model has, typically has indirect effects through factors onto indicators of the factors and few direct effects. And we've always said that you can't have, you can't have both. You can't have all direct effects and indirect effects as well. The save by the day here by S not influencing math 7. So uh, you will, what you will find here is that this model is identified. And if you're uncertain, you know, some models you can dream more wildly than uh, statistics can handle. Some models are not going to be identifiable, which means that even if you get estimates, they, they are not meaningful. So the model has to be identified to be uh, meaningful. M meaningful, uh, statisticians call that estimable, not a cocktail um, phrase. So uh, cocktail party conversation item. So uh, this model with S pointing to math 7 would not be uh, identified. Now, if you don't know which ones would be identified, you can always rely on um, the uh, singularity of the estimated information matrix matter. So you don't want your estimated information matrix to be singular, folks. You don't want that. And the program will tell you, the program cannot compute standard errors when that information matrix is singular. So the fact that you get standard errors will indicate most surely that the model is identified. So uh, if you, uh, you could try that. You can, imp you can uh, uh, try to uh, uh, saturate the model, uh, include more parameters to the point where you will get that warning. You get it very clearly. I should say there's another reason um, that this model is identified, and that is that these slopes here from S to MAP are not free but fixed. You know, one, two, three. So they're not fixed coefficients, which is another difference between this model and the mimic. So uh, that's quite possible to identify this one. Yeah, let's see. Who else? Yes. I was wondering if you can test these models with a the slope for time varying covariates, but no slope for growth. And so, I mean, I know this is a, a, we're talking about growth modeling, but I'm just wondering in the case of um, ecological momentary assessments, maybe over a week, where you wouldn't expect there to be growth, but you expect there to be time varying covariates that could have lagged effects or concurrent effects. Yeah. So can you just test this yeah. the same way, just not have that? S yeah, so if you have panel data where you don't expect any trend, you can just drop this. Uh, it's the like, same thing as saying that it's fixed and the mean is zero. Doesn't affect growth. Maybe you have I in there. Individu different individuals have different levels, but stay at that level uh, to capture the, and, and, and you know, if it's repeated measures, you want to capture the correlation across time by having at least I influencing all time points. So the interclass correlation is modeled once again. But, uh, your, but your focus may be on, on these. Yeah, so that's perfectly, perfectly okay, yes. Yeah. 'd so um, it's particularly these paths then that are critical what's the sample side need is the question for estimating parameters of this kind of a model to estimate these drops these permanent changes in development um, so you would certainly have to have somebody who changes status at each time point and you'd certainly want to have a couple of people changing status at each time point how many do you need? How many people do you need to estimate one parameter? Well, <laughs> you need at least one to identify it, one who does change compared to others. But if you only have one, your standard error is going to be very large. Right. So uh, 
And it's very hard to compute uh, or, or to figure out how uh, many people you have to have that change for the standard error to be uh, acceptable. Acceptable meaning that standard error has to be less than half of the estimate for it to be significant if, if it really is non-zero. So uh, that's probably most easily answered by a Monte Carlo study where you uh, uh, play around with the size of the effect, the size of the drop here relative to the, sam to the sample size, sample size in particular with respect to the people who change status. But I don't think you need to have that many. I, don't, I would think it's rather few at each time point who change status, I would guess. This is only one parameter. Okay, more questions, yes? Okay, so the question um, is, uh, what about a combination of using time scores and, and quadratic growth modeling? And uh, uh, one could certainly start out with uh, two growth factors and have three time scores for the slope and, and see what the shape, the estimated mean curve looks like. If it looks quadratic, instead of bumping up and down, then maybe you want to add a quadratic. So it could be a way to explore that. Or you could certainly have three time scores in the quadratic model. With three growth factors, you could have three time scores. Uh, you would have an estimate, then um, you know, then you would have to use the by statements uh, to have a. Well, actually, maybe you can use the uh, the bar statement as well. I haven't thought about that, but it should be able to. You should be able to combine a quadratic with uh, estimated time score. It just gets to be a more complicated shape. Yeah, I think that's where the challenge is. It would be a quadratic that goes like this, but then has a upswing at one time point. So you have it going like this, but then coming up. Actually, what I'm finding is minus, it's just for short. Yeah, so it's just a, um, there's more of a leveling off than an actual quadratic of the real time point. So it's an acceleration, accelerated drop. Right. I see. Right, and you can certainly do that by, f by having a free time score at the last time point. You fit the curve better, but you don't get m very much further. You can't explain why it happened because you can't predict that part. But what I'm saying is you get that estimation and then you plug it back in as a fixed effect, but, but you can still predict the curve part. Right. Yeah, no, but then the predictor of the quadratic is not does not have to do with the prediction of that extra drop, which you may be after. Maybe a time variant covariate, what happens at that time point? Or maybe that extra drop is because of selective attrition. Topic of yesterday, tomorrow afternoon, not yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> ah, it's late in the day. Okay, yes. Um, slide number 137. 137. Okay, so the question is, what if you have <coughs> two groups, uh, intervention and control group, and you, you want to work with these two models, and uh, you want, so you want to do, uh, you want to look for intervention effects in that model and intervention effects in this model? Good question. No idea. No, but um, you <laughs> could, what you could do <coughs> in uh, intervention modeling, I would, I would start out I would start out with the uh, control group, the normative development, and in the control group, make a choice between the two models. And then I would stay with that one and do intervention modeling. So for instance here, the intervention would be uh, a time invariant covariate, which influences development. Say that the intervention happens after the first time point. 
which implies that the intervention cannot influence I, because it refers to the first time point, but can influence S. Uh, the intervention could also influence STVC, the influence of time variant covariates, although I've not seen applications of that, I don't think. But I would start out with the normative development and see, um, cho choose a model there first. <coughs> yeah. Okay. More. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. And then the first drop is for them to get married at. Never get married. Get married early. Get married late. Yeah. Get married early. Is that equal to the second time point? Like yeah. Yeah. This is times so getting married here is early and here is later. Yeah. And how would you like? What, would the syntax look for that? Would it be like an I two I three? It, it would be um, based on this one. Right. So. so you, so this one, you know, if you, if you think, now you can think in terms of factor analysis here. So what, what the question is, what would the syntax in M plus B for including these factors? Um, this would be then, uh, let's call this F1, F2, F3, F4. So say F1, for instance, or F2. F2 by Y2 at 1, Y3 at 1, Y4 at 1. And then F2 on whatever the name of that covariate is. And then the residual variance being zero, F2 at zero. Okay. Those would be the three things you would do. So it is essentially like another intercept. It's like you're it is, yeah, you could think of it as another intercept, exactly, yes. You're dropping onto another regime with a different intercept mean. Thank you. OK. How about a 15-minute break? We'll meet back here shortly before 4 o'clock. <laughs>